Heart disease kills far more people every year than cancer. That's a fact that may surprise you. If it does, it's probably thanks to the many successes that science and the medical profession have accomplished that's made it less scary than it once was. Hyder Varich is a cardiologist at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. His new book, State of the Heart, Exploring the History, Science, and Future of Cardiac Disease, takes in the sweep of that progress. It's very nice to meet you to talk about this. Thank you so much. Um, I was really surprised to learn that heart disease has been studied since ancient times. Why did you want to explore that history in the book? Well, I think that... Uh... You know, part of it is because I, I think unless we look at history and history and look at it in a critical way, then how will we learn about, you know, what are the things that we can do better moving forward? And certainly, you know, heart, the heart has been such an integral, uh, you know, part of our lives, really from the first few descriptions of not just health, but of human life, uh, that I felt that there was a, there's a lot more that we can learn uh, especially as we try and avoid some of the missteps we have made in the past. And one thing I really liked about the book is that you make it easy to understand a very difficult topic. Was that one of your intentions in writing this book? I mean, certainly I think that when I wrote the book, I, I really wanted people uh, to go on a journey that they can be immersed in. And, and if I make it too hard or too technical, mm -hmm. then I'll lose people along the way. So I wanted to write something that people can really really get involved in and not just think about the heart, but really think about what, it, what this means about what it means to be a human being. And also to know their body a bit better, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, early on in the state of the heart, you write, even as we have made tremendous progress in helping people live through heart attacks, there is still so much we don't know about what causes heart attacks and what is the best way to treat them. Many think of heart attacks as being a modern disease, a consequence of the ills of our sanitary, overconsumptive lifestyles, yet that couldn't be further from the truth. So when I read that, I hear that you're saying that a lack of exercise or maybe eating that extra pastry doesn't contribute to heart disease. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that I think that both of those things really do cause heart disease, but in some cases. I think increasingly what, what, what I've seen and what I think others have noted as well is that People, when, when someone gets heart disease, it's almost like it is their fault that, oh, you, you, you weren't careful enough, you didn't eat right, or you didn't exercise. But that's just part of the story. I think what we also need to look at is that a lot of people get heart disease, you know, really out of the blue just because of, you know, bad genetics or, or really the sort of societal structures that enable such poor lifestyle choices to occur in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at someone, when we look at people and they're having a lot of, uh, sort of, they're, they're making a lot of bad dietary choices, we need to look at what are we doing in society and what are we doing in our health system that are allowing for that to happen. And, and the reason that's really important is because I think that if people don't have if people believe that heart disease is someone's fault, they're never going to react to it in the same way. If you think about what happens when someone gets diagnosed with cancer, for example. People rally behind them. It's, it's, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if I go to a patient's room and they've just been uh, diagnosed with cancer, they're, they're, it's usually full of people. It's mm -hmm. usually full of cards, full of flowers, full of hope, full of strength. Uh, and there's a the society, family really rallies around people in a way that they don't do for heart disease. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book to change those narratives. Um, over the course of the book, you write that the number of people dying from heart disease is increasing, but that also advancements in the treatment of heart disease are leading to fewer deaths. Uh, so how can it be both of those things? Well, first of all, the, the number of people who reach older ages has increased. And so as the number of people who are uh, you know, living to their 70s and 80s is increasing, that, prevalent, that, that also means that the number of people who are at risk for heart disease has also increased. The other thing that we've seen is that also the types of heart disease that we're seeing is changing. So in the 1960s, 90, or, or really in the sort of most of the 20th century, the major cause of death was people dying of heart attacks. And over the last 50 years, we've seen tremendous progress in that space. But now what we're also seeing is that people are living through those heart attacks but are developing other conditions such as heart failure, which is really a more chronic condition. So even though the number of people who are, who are dying of heart disease, the rate is re reducing, but the number of people who live long enough to have a heart attack is increasing. The other thing that we are seeing is that heart disease used to be thought of as a disease of affluent countries. 
we used to think that, well, if you're in a place like India or Pakistan, or China, or Brazil, you're more likely to have an infectious disease, et cetera. But that has really changed because of, again, progress in other diseases, but also people, people living long enough to have heart disease. So now heart disease, heart attacks, and sort of uh, the whole sort of milieu is responsible, is the reason for the majority of deaths, not only in countries such as the United States or Canada, but also in countries such as India, China, Brazil, Pakistan, et cetera. So it's a growing, it's a growing phenomenon around the world. It is, and it's changing how I think we need to really sort of frame things uh, as far as, you know, what can we do to help the rest of the world? A lot of times we focus just on infectious diseases, but we really need to start thinking more about these non-communicable diseases like heart disease. Um, let's go back into the book again. And you write in State of the Heart, to win the battle for people's hearts, doctors need to win over their minds. Um, how much of a challenge is it for you to deal with the warning signs of a heart disease in a patient who says they feel just fine? Well, I think that... Um, First of all, if someone feels fine, that's that's great, and, and we, we don't need to medicalize healthy people. But at the same time, what we also need to do is having people think about the risks of disease going forward. You know, I think one of the things is that people are living longer and longer. So we just don't, we need to have people think about the long game, not just live, not just look at the next five years, 10 years, but really look at living a long, healthy life. And one of the things that uh, is important is that taking care of heart disease now or the risk factors for heart disease now, some of the, pay, some of the payoff will not happen in the next five years, 10 years. It'll, it'll happen much longer uh, down the path. Uh, so I think having people be more engaged with themselves, giving them agency, telling them that they can, in fact, if they put their hearts and minds to it, they can, in fact, change their outcome and their risk of having heart disease. I think that's really something that's very important. So without, without being fear mongers, so to speak, mm -hmm. I think that what we, can, what we need to do is carry patients in this journey, walk with them, be in their shoes, and then really have them think about what it means to have a long and healthy life. At, in this time. Like empowering them. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of really interesting studies in the book, um, and one that you mentioned was a recent assessment of 159 medical students. And they were tested on uh, what you say, the steps required for accurate blood pressure measurement. How many of those students got all the steps correct? I think it was so low that I... I, I think I, it was one. It was just one. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, that goes back to thinking about heart, heart hypertension uh, used to kill one in every two people in the United States. What is hypertension? Hypertension is high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And again, the definition of that has changed over time. Uh, but it is one of the biggest preventable causes of death in the entire world. And you'd think that that would be something that elicits more attention, not just from uh, the public, but really from the physicians who are taking care of it. and. And yet, as this study showed, and it was eye-opening for me, that very few people even know how to measure blood pressure well. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, it, it just doesn't evoke the same type of attention. But the interesting I was, thing I would still say is that even when not measured accurately, it still gives us so much information. Well, how much uh, do you really learn about a patient's heart health from taking their blood pressure? You, you learn, I mean, heart, high blood pressure, not only uh, leads to, is one of the biggest risk factors for heart attacks, but it also is one of the, probably the biggest risk factor for stroke, for one of the biggest risk factors for heart failure. So just that simple step is actually, really opens up your, a window into someone's health, unlike very few p things that we have in our uh, arsenal. And so with the, the doctor, the students learning to be doctors have to know all the steps, Absolutely. Right? Uh, um, in the book, you share that your father uh, experienced a heart attack. Um, what happened after he had the heart attack? Well, I, um, I was asleep, and uh, my, my father, I work in the United States. My father um, is uh, back in home in Pakistan. And um, my, uh, this, was, this happened at, in the morning, his time. He had never had any type of heart issues, and he started uh, feeling sweaty. And he, he didn't feel right. And my mother, who is a dentist, immediately knew something was wrong. And instead of calling uh, the ambulance, she put him in the back of her, uh, the car and just drove him to the nearest uh, heart hospital um, she could go to. And uh, when, the, when, she, uh, when he got there, they did an EKG, an electrocardiogram that you have uh, displayed nicely in the back. They found out that he was having a heart attack. And... Um, Within, by the time, within about 30 or 35 minutes, 
they had already done this procedure in which they had opened up the blood vessel that was blocked and that was obstructing blood flow in his heart. So when he called me, everything was taken care of. And to me, that was such a, I felt both helpless that I am not there with him, but at the same time, I was so thankful that we had made that type of progress, that the type of care that he would have received if he were in Toronto, if he were in Boston or New York, he got the same treatment, the same care in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And that is such a great, um, that, that, and everyone who's involved with that journey, all the people who have helped uh, develop these uh, therapies that have then uh, helped them, help patients get them, they should be proud of that. Mm -hmm. that. That you can be really in most parts of the world, you'll be able to get such great therapies uh, for heart attacks. And that is something that I think not a lot of people realize is one of the greatest achievements of our, of our species almost. Oh. And so to me, it was, it was humbling. Uh, and, and thankfully, he's done great since then. I was just uh, about to ask. Yeah, yeah he's, done, he's done great. He takes his med medications. Uh, he's never had any other uh, symptoms since then. But I, I think that when I look at that, I think that's a story that most people don't realize, the impact of that for not just uh, people here in uh, countries like Canada and the United States, but really all over the world. And we have longer time with our loved ones. Of course. Um, as part of your dad's cardiac treatment, he received a stent. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is that and how do they come to be used? So uh, how heart attacks happen is that, uh, so your heart uh, is surrounded by blood vessels called the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. And so even though the, blood, the heart is full of blood, it still needs blood supply to keep doing what it's doing. And those come from these blood vessels that wrap around the heart. Uh, one of these blood vessels is called the LAD, uh, also referred to as the widow maker. Um, and uh, in heart because in, before it was uh, someone would lose their spouse, usually men. It was it, it was thought at that time that yeah. heart disease is purely a, a, a phenomenon that affects men, and we can we can talk about that as mm -hmm. well. Um, but having uh, and uh, what would happen in, what happens in heart attacks is that you get blockages in these blood vessels, uh, that so the heart itself doesn't get blood and heart tissue starts to die off. And now we have a lot of therapies that can help in the long term, but if you have an acute obstruction of blood flow in one of the arteries, that can result in a uh, heart attack uh, called a myocardial infarction. Um, and so that's what he had. And uh, starting in the 1970s, uh, scientists start, uh, and sort of clinical researchers really started to think about, well, how can we... Uh, help patients in their this hour of need, and one of the therapies that was developed was the stent, which is really a small sort of metal wire uh, frame mm -hmm. that can be deployed using minimally invasive techniques um, through just a small incision in someone's leg or in someone's wrist, all the way to the heart, uh, and that can be used to open up uh, these obstructions. Science is amazing. It's amazing, <laughs> and it's uh, it's it's really really wonderful, and the data in acute heart attacks is really. Uh, so compelling and the story of how these therapies were developed and the people who developed it was just mm -hmm. such a fascinating journey for me uh, and really reading about these uh, you know these uh, trailblazers mm. who uh, the one of the key uh, people that I talked about was Andreas Grunzig he was a, a German born clinical researcher and he developed these uh, the um, the technology that now helps us deliver stents uh, on his uh, on his table on his dinner table uh, and in the kitchen sink uh, and is now uh, who he unfortunately tragically died in a plane crash when he was still a young man and I wish he were here to see the things that he set into motion have saved so many people's lives including my dad's his legacy lives on. Mm -hmm. um, you point out that the medical device industry in the States is valued at $140 billion. That is a staggering amount of money. Um, how has that industry influenced the use of things such as stents and new forms of cardiac imaging? So, you know, I think talking about Andreas Grunzig, before there was really an industry, uh, medical devices and technology was being developed by scientists and researchers in you know in their kitchen sink basically, but as technology has developed and matured, um, and uh, they consolidated into into what is you can be called the you know medical drug and device industry, 
And as I think stents are a great example of what the impact of the, uh, this industry has been in helping patients, but at the same time, we have to realize that these are all businesses and they're run like any other business would. And in the end, even though they do achieve great outcomes for a lot of patients, in the end, what is very important to them and their solvency is um, really is, is money. And, and this is all, and, and what their share, shareholders' interests will trump any others. So I think that so we need to be very, uh, we need to be encouraging of innovation in medical devices, because as you know, I think the stent story is a great example of how uh, they can, in fact, save lives. But at the same time, we also need to push back when skepticism is necessary ab about these devices, because in the end, they are going into other human beings. And we need to hold them to a level of evidence that we would for drug companies. So one of the interesting things uh, that has evolved is that the level of evidence required for a device to get approved is much lower than that for a medication. And I think that that's one standard that definitely needs to be looked at very stringently. Again, this is not to say that we need to s slow down innovation or that you know they're all uh, you know they're all bad guys. In fact, you know the benefits of uh, the industry are for everyone to see. But at the same time, I do think that we can hold them to a higher standard of safety. That to use them when they're needed. Absolutely. Um, you also write, which I found really surprising, that until just a few decades ago, women were barely the focus of research when it when we talk about heart disease. Uh, why was that? Well, some of it, uh, so, you know, I think just for everyone, heart disease kills as many women as it does men. Mm -hmm. This is something that we recognize now, uh, but still a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people still think of heart disease as a disease of men. And certainly when we started to think about when heart disease first became prominent, and this is really around uh, the time of the 1940s and 50s, it was uh, affecting a lot of young men. And so the idea became that, that, and yet the women who were being affected were either not being diagnosed or they were, being di or they were having heart disease at older ages. Mm -hmm. So they just didn't uh, really fit the stereotype of someone who, who had heart disease. That's something that's thankfully changed now. We are starting to realize that women also have uh, a very high risk for heart disease, especially if they have risk factors. They do have heart disease slightly after uh, men do. So amongst uh, at least younger women don't have as much heart disease as men do. But when they do, they actually may have worse outcomes because they may not themselves realize that they have, they're have at a risk of heart because disease. Because you, you write that uh, the signs, the symptoms presents, present themselves differently in women than they do in men. How does it, what are the differences? So this is, uh, this is an area that I, I would say that I think most people think that the number of patients with heart disease or heart attacks who have atypical symptoms, so other than chest pain or chest pressure, difficult breathing, is more common amongst women than men. There are some studies that don't show that, but I think it is fair to say that uh, the more studies, uh, more women are likely to have atypical symptoms, such as something as simple as you know, nausea or vomiting or a feeling of a sense of doom or, or breathing issues as opposed to the classic chest pain that men have, mm -hmm. uh, that most men have. Uh, so th there are cer certain differences in, um, in symptoms, but there's also a, an awareness issue that a lot of women just don't think that they're at risk for heart disease. And that's a failure on our part as a medical community, um, that we have not sensitized women enough of the risks of heart disease um, in women as we have men. Uh, if you think about a disease like breast cancer, for example, if you look at the coverage that breast cancer receives, if you look at the, uh, it, it is much, it is seen, uh, it evokes a very different set of emotions than heart disease in women. What we've also realized over time is that the type of heart disease women have is different from that in men. And one of, uh, one of the stories I shared was that uh, of a woman who had uh, was called a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Now, in normal heart attacks, there's a blockage in the heart vessel, but in, in this condition called SCAD, the blockage is actually because of a tear that happens in one of these critical coronary arteries. And for a long time, we just didn't even recognize it. But it, now it is because of women such as her and other, uh, uh, others that we are starting to realize that not only do women have as much heart disease as men, but that the type of disease that they have is different and that and we just can't help them as well as 
uh, we do now because we just haven't studied it well enough. And more time needs to be to find out uh, better solutions. Absolutely. Um, something else that you write about is you use this term called diagnost diagnostic creep. Uh, what does that mean? So diagnostic creep basically means that um, increasingly we are uh, that you know diagnoses that were first made in very very sick patients are now being made made in increasingly healthier or sort of patients at lower risk. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the ways that we so when we first started diagnosing heart attacks, the only tool that we really had was something called the EKG, which is right here in the back. Mm -hmm. Then we. But we were missing patients who were having heart attacks who did not have abnormalities on the EKG. And then we developed these lab tests, blood tests called troponins, uh, that could detect heart damage in the absence of any changes on the, heart, uh, on the EKG. Uh, but now we are moving into a time when we have new lab blood tests called high-sensitivity troponins. Mm -hmm. These blood tests are so sensitive that they can be elevated even in perfectly normal people, perfectly healthy people. Mm -hmm. And so the, the risk of using these inappropriately is that you may diagnose a lot more patients with heart attacks when they just aren't having them. And when we don't know if the therapies that we are giving them are going to be as useful in them as in those patients who have had, uh, who would have heart attacks diagnosed based on previous types of blood tests or on the EKG. Uh, you discuss in the book the differences between a medical trial and an observational study. How are they different? So I think this is one of the key uh, things that I wish to do in the book. <clears throat> a lot of times when people, uh, when the public is exposed uh, to research, uh, they're done so in a very flawed way. Um, I think that what we need to do is really start educating the public at large about medical research so that they can be more informed about the information that they're getting. Mm -hmm. So think about this. When you, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I used to love reading Reader's Digest, and one day you'd read that coffee is good, and the other week you'd read that it is it's you bad know, poison. You. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and part of why that's happened is because of the evidence that those findings are based on. A clinical trial, uh, especially a randomized clinical trial, is some of the highest level of evidence that we we can generate. But a lot of times, the studies that you read about in the lay press. Are based uh, are from observational studies in which they didn't, um, in which patients uh, could have been different, in which uh, a lot of different factors that may be affecting those findings are not captured. Uh, uh, you use a really great example in the book about having a lighter in your pocket. We just have a few more minutes. Um, can you explain that um, observation? Right. So I mean, so if if you were to go around and look at patients with a high risk of. Uh, uh, lung cancer, and if you just started to see how many of them are carrying lighters, you would you would see that patients who have lung cancer are at higher risk if they have lighters in their pocket. That does not mean that the lighter is causing cancer. It means that patients who are likely to smoke are more likely to have lighters. So this is what's called a confounding. Mm -hmm. And observational studies are at very high risk for confounding because they just aren't capturing all the information and because the patients that they're looking at might be different. Randomized controlled trials are able to minimize or eliminate confounding factors. And there, therefore, I think what we need to do and what I hope to achieve through the book is not just teach people about heart disease, but teach them about the science underlying heart disease so that they can be more informed when they read studies or they read results uh, in the lay press. And journalists play a role in this, right? Because I, you, like you say in the book that newspapers and websites are more likely to cover the observational studies. Um, what can be done to address this problem? So first of all, you know, we need to work together. Physicians and journalists and researchers, we need to work together so we can learn from you, but also we can, uh, and you can learn from us. And one of the key things that I think we need to do is really hold, um, hold everyone, all of us involved uh, to a higher standard. We, as academics, we can, uh, there's a lot of information that shows that, you know, university press releases are very inaccurate about studies, that they will release studies that will overstate the findings or mis minimize limitations. I think the same thing needs to be done uh, for, for the lay press as well, that I think that we need to be more skeptical about the news stories we put out. Uh, and by and one of the ways that we can do that is by addressing or sort of uh, addressing some of the limitations of the research. So, for example, if a study has been done only in mice, we need to be upfront about that. That this only sh uh, these results only reflect animal data, not and that they don't necessarily translate into humans so far. Uh, so, I think all of us can do a better job, academics, journalists, uh, and consumers, in really 
really learning and getting up to speed about what makes good science and what are findings that we can uh, be much more sure about uh, than others. Well, I, I will say this book is great. I learned a lot more uh, from some, I don't have a background in science, but I feel a little smarter, more knowledgeable and more empowered. So thank you. Oh, of course. Thank you so much for reading the book and for having me. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.